Happy Lord's Day to everybody, and thanks for joining us once again for another reading from the Word of God. We invite you to turn with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 12 and read through the end of the chapter in verse 20. So turn with us together there. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So today's text reveals a startling problem in Corinth. Some in the church, and we don't know how many, we don't know who, but some in the church are hiring prostitutes. Now, Paul doesn't levy this accusation specifically against any of them directly. But his bringing up prostitution at this point in the letter doesn't make any sense at all, um, unless he's addressing an actual problem that's going on there in Corinth. And plus, Paul's language is way too pointed for somebody who's just bringing up a generic warning, right? So imagine that, you know, Paul's just saying, oh, you know, I've, I've got no reason to say this. I just decided, you know, now would be a good time to warn you against hiring prostitutes. I, it, that doesn't make much sense, much less his very, very pointed language. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? All right, this is, this is clearly some kind of an issue there. I mean, it would be a really bizarre way for Paul to issue just a general warning for something that was not currently a problem in the church, but that might become a temptation or a problem later on. Now, the way that Paul is, is speaking here, strikes us is he's clearly addressing an some existent problem in the church and understanding uh, what other problems the church in Corinth has had I don't see any reason to doubt that this is an actual problem at Corinth in fact this might strike us as kind of tame con uh, you know, compared to the sexual problem that we read about in first Corinthians chapter 5 uh, a man having relations with his uh, his own father's wife now, if this text, or is so, so we're pretty sure they've, they've got a problem in Corinth with at least some of them hiring prostitutes. But if this text was just about prostitution, then this would be like one of the shortest sermons that I've ever recorded. Like we could basically say, Look, just don't, right? That's all there is to it. That's the whole lesson right there, right? I can just hit the stop button on the recorder, post this to YouTube, and then we're done. Right, like Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Right, if that's all that the text was about, that's really all Paul all Paul would have to say is flee sexual immorality. Right, this this would be a very very short text from Paul, um, and he's already reminded us at the end of our last reading that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right, it applies to the problem um, that we read about earlier in the chapter about their going to law against each other, uh, that worldly judges are not heirs of the kingdom because they engage in these worldly kinds of things, including sexual immorality. Uh, but that what, what Paul says um, in verses, say, around 10, 11, that neighborhood uh, in this chapter, also applies to the church. Um, it, those who are those who are unrighteous, those who are immoral, um, 
including those in the church, will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? So if we apply that to today's reading, the message is like, you Christians who are visiting and hiring prostitutes will not inherit the kingdom. Again, the lesson would be very, very simple if that's all Paul had to say about it, but that's not all that Paul writes because that is not Corinth's only problem. You know how some problems are symptomatic of deeper problems? Right? Like you see a problem going on and you identify like that is a problem in and of itself. If that was the only thing I was seeing, that would be a problem by itself. But that problem suggests that there are other deeper problems going on. Well, that's what's going on here in Corinth in our text today. Paul not only addresses their use of prostitutes, but also their rationale for doing so, uh, because why they're doing what they're doing is also a problem. And we should wonder about their rationale, because remember, the brothers at Corinth consider themselves to be wise, consider themselves to be spiritual people. We'll read about that, especially later on in the book. They're very, very concerned about their spiritual gifts, um, who is counted to be spiritual among them. So that might strike us as just completely contradictory to us today, right? If you consider yourself to be a spiritual person, that kind of precludes hiring prostitutes. So what makes them think that they, as spiritual people, well, well, what makes them think that they can go out hiring prostitutes and still call themselves spiritual people? What makes them think that they are at liberty to do this? Well, we'll talk about that today. You also might have noticed that Paul spends a lot of his time in this passage, in fact, most of his time in this passage, talking about the body, right? The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? The sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Right? The entire passage is dominated by the discussion of the body. Why is that? Well, we'll cover that today, too. But before we go into any of that, we need to take a small detour um, into talking about how we read this text. All right, now we know that Paul and Corinth have been writing each other letters. So what we have in our New Testament as 1 Corinthians is not the first letter that either of them has written to each other. Um, we have had letters referenced in other places that we'll talk about. We know that those letters have at least partially been about sex, right? So anytime that we read about sex in 1 Corinthians, we're jumping into the middle of an ongoing conversation between Paul and Corinth. Right? We saw that in chapter 5, where Paul refers back to something that he wrote to them in a previous letter. We're going to see it again in the next chapter, in chapter 7, when Paul refers to something that they wrote to him, some questions that they had uh, about sexual relations. So, now the difficulty is that Paul may not always signify when he is repeating things back to them versus when he is speaking uh, purely for himself. And that causes some difficulties with interpreting today's text. Uh, we call this the slogan problem because it has to do with so-called Corinthian slogans that Paul may be quoting uh, here in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. Uh, so the question is, is Paul repeating some of the Corinthian sayings back to them? Or is he speaking entirely for himself? Now you'll notice um, if you go to... Uh, well, the ESV translation that we read from today, you'll notice it in some other translations as well, um, but the ESV at least places parts of today's passage in quotation marks. So our translators at least think that those parts are Corinthian sayings. Right Now, those quotation marks don't exist in the Greek, but that's because biblical Greek didn't have quotation marks, and that's part of why we have this problem. Um, you know, In English, we have... Quotation marks designed specifically so that it's supposed to be clear to us 
when a set of words um, is us speaking for ourselves versus when a, a set of words is us speaking for someone else. Biblical Greek doesn't have that. Koine Greek doesn't have that. Um, and so, hence the problem. Uh, how do you tell when someone is quoting someone else? All right, now, I intend for this to be a sermon and not a Bible class, so I'm just going to tell you outright what I think about it um, without spending half an hour justifying it. I do think that Paul is quoting their sayings back at them and refuting them in this passage. But I don't think that the ESV has properly identified everything that the Corinthians are saying. Right, so I've left the ESV's quotation marks where they are. Um, what, I've, what I've presented in the slides is the ESV's uh, rendering of things. I don't think that they've completely gotten it right. Um, so we'll get to that as we come to it. But these sayings of theirs, these Corinthian slogans, if you want to call them that, tell us why the brothers in Corinth feel justified in doing what they've been doing. And they explain why Paul answers them in the way that he does. So the first Corinthian slogan that explains their rationale for using prostitutes uh, is actually the very first thing that we read in today's passage in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, meaning all things are permitted. Now we would be surprised, I think, to find Paul expressing this kind of libertine sentiment we'd be less surprised to find people at Corinth using this, especially when we remember the culture that they are coming from. When you remember that they are first century Romans, influenced heavily by Greek culture, they, they're, they're very, uh, as we described um, earlier on, they're a very, very bustling city. They get lots and lots of tourists from all over the Roman Empire. They're also connected to the Greek mainland. Um, so they're, they're thoroughly cosmopolitan. It makes sense why they think, particularly, that using prostitutes is permissible, because that was the common belief among Greco-Roman people. Um, it really wasn't even a question. Right? So, for example, the Greek Stoic philosopher Epictetus um, he was a contemporary with Paul. He was, he was a generation or two younger than Paul, uh, but their lives did overlap somewhat. Um, and he wrote in his work, The Enchiridion, uh, as to pleasure with women, right, and this is, this is Epictetus speaking, as to pleasure with women, abstain as far as you can before marriage. But if you do indulge in it, do it in the way which is legitimate or lawful, or customary. What he's referring to is the use of slaves and prostitutes, because that was what was legal and customary. Uh, that's what was considered legitimate in, uh, in Greco-Roman culture at that time. To the Greco-Roman mind, it barely even counted as having sex, uh, which is why you find even one of the Stoics promoting it. The Stoics are, I mean, there's a reason why the English word Stoic means what it means. Um, they, they tend to promote a great amount of restraint and personal responsibility. In fact, there's, well, there's a reason why the Stoics are experiencing something of a renaissance among, uh, among modern people, particularly modern Christians, who go back and read people like Epictetus or read Marcus Aurelius, uh, and in a lot of places, their morality seems to parallel with our own. But then you come to places like this in the Enchiridion, um, and it, it just gives you a sense of how widespread, how permissible uh, this was considered to be, that even a Stoic like Epictetus says, well, look, if you've, if you've got to indulge that, uh, that desire before marriage, you know, it, at least do it in the normal way, that is, using slaves or using prostitutes. Now, that's the Greek, you know, the, the Greco-Roman mindset. Um, and that is what I think uh, the brethren in Corinth have held over from 
uh, perhaps their life before their conversion, their life outside of the church. I'm pretty sure it's their belief because Paul refutes that belief. As always, Paul is bringing them back to the pattern of the cross. That, that's been our constant theme throughout these lessons. They depart from the pattern of the cross, go after the way of the world, and Paul draws them back to the cross. He points them to the way of Jesus Christ. That's not what you learned from the cross, he says. Our reading today closes with these words. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. All right, so they're saying everything is lawful for me. Everything's permitted. I am at liberty to do this, that, or the other thing specifically to go out and hire prostitutes. I'm at liberty to do that. I have my rights, you know. And Paul says, no, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. In fact, he has flipped the entire thing on its head because the gospel, the cross, flips the whole thing on its head. The brothers in Corinth think that they're at liberty to buy people for their pleasure. The cross says, you are not at liberty. And in fact, you are the one who has been bought. You've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. And so you are not at liberty. Now, our modern churches may not suffer from the same prostitution problem that they had in Corinth, but we are certainly plagued by this Corinthian attitude of individual liberty and standing on our own rights. Now, that includes some other forms of sexual liberty. It may not manifest in the same way. It doesn't look like prostitution in the modern church, by and large, uh, but it manifests itself in other ways. We consider ourselves to be at liberty. Some people consider themselves to be at liberty uh, with sex and other forms. Um, I think most people in the American church generally consider themselves to be just generally at liberty, right? I belong to myself. The cross says, no, you don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. And these are the words that we, along with Corinth, need to hear from Paul. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. That is, you belong to someone else. You belong to the Lord. The next Corinthian slogan is that explains their motivation for, you know, their, their rationale for why they're hiring prostitutes is the one that Paul, I think, dedicates most of his time to answering. It's also the one that I think the ESV gets wrong. Um, the, the ESV puts quotation marks around part of this, but not all of it. The slogan is this, food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Right? The ESV has Paul saying that last part for himself, God will destroy both one and the other. And if you were to just take that part of the passage by itself, I, I think you could justifiably say that. Uh, you could almost look at it as, well, Corinth is saying food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Like They're taking this particular attitude about the body. And Paul is answering that with, God will destroy both one and the other. It, taken in the whole context of the passage, though, that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, and in fact, it makes best sense of the whole passage to understand that whole thing is a Corinthian saying. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. I think it's best to understand all of that as a Corinthian saying because it explains why Paul spends so much time talking about the body in this passage, including refuting that last bit about God destroying the stomach. All right, so let's start with the first bit, though. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And folks, they're not talking about food, right? In the context that I hope we all understand what they mean when they're saying food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. They are talking about a different kind of appetite, and Greco-Roman culture talked about sexual desire as an appetite just the same as we do. In fact, that's, that's where we get our own habit of talking about it as an appetite. Uh, take, for example, the Roman poet Horace. Um, he writes, when your throat is parched, you don't have to drink from a golden goblet. 
When you're experiencing a thirst of a different sort, don't turn your nose up at a slave girl or a slave boy. In other words, his, his message is, well, look, if you're really thirsty, you wouldn't be picky about what kind of vessel you drink out of. So when you've got that other kind of thirst, don't be picky about what kind of vessel you use. All right, now that's... that. I don't know exactly how to describe it. That strikes us as pretty bad, right? <laughs> but like we saw with Epictetus... The Greco-Roman attitude was that some lower-class people exist to sate the appetites of upper-class people. Uh, again, we, we might not find this, this attitude in the church today, but we do still find it in society at large today, right? Um, with relatively few exceptions... Uh, modern-day prostitutes are not high-class people. They're not people of status. They're people who generally live on the streets, people who are used by other people in society. Um, and the, the vast, vast majority of people who end up in prostitution don't want to be there. Um, in that way... American culture broadly has the same attitude that Greco-Roman culture had. That, look, some people just exist to satisfy the appetites of people who can afford it. The Greco-Roman mindset was also that those kinds of appetites are completely natural and are meant to be satisfied. And again, this is a kind of attitude that we find expressed in modern-day American culture. Right. This, in fact, you could very well imagine uh, someone out in you know secular American culture using exactly this same saying to justify sexual libertinism: "Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food." Right. You're not going to deny that kind of appetite. You're not going to deny your thirst. Right. And you're not going to necessarily be super picky about it if you're if your appetite is great enough. So, so I think it makes sense to see this as a, as a Corinthian slogan uh, that, again, might strike us as a kind of pretty low-down, low-brow, but it was a very common attitude in their day, uh, just as it was a common attitude in our day. But the brothers in Corinth are even further dismissive of the moral... Uh, the moral nature, the moral element of sex, because of their attitude towards the body in general, that God will destroy both one and the other. This also was a common Greco-Roman idea, that the body and the spirit are completely separate things. So much so that a lot of matters concerning the body had no effect on the spirit, but particularly food, right? There's a reason why you would bring up a saying like food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, right? Because what, what influence does that have on the soul? At least as far as one of these Greeks or Romans would think, it doesn't really have any effect on the soul, right? If I eat a hamburger today, that, that has no effect on my immortal soul. Right? If I choose instead to eat a salad, that has no effect on my mortal soul. Um, what they're doing is taking this kind of logic to a different conclusion. Um, this idea that matters concerning the body had no effect on the soul, on the spirit. Now we give this, um, we give this idea a few different names like dualism or Platonism or Neoplatonism. But the idea is that the body just doesn't matter. In fact, a lot of these people believed that the body uh, is actually bad, that it's actually holding your spirit back. Uh, uh, a lot of these uh, philosophers likened the body to a prison, and your soul is being held imprisoned in this body of flesh, and you're just waiting for your spirit to be released. And so the idea is that the body just doesn't matter because it's going to be destroyed anyway, right? And that's at best, right? At worst, you actually want it to be destroyed because it's, it's bad. 
The Corinthians have taken this idea to a, a rather sordid conclusion, that if the body's just going to be destroyed and doesn't matter anyway, well, then just have at it with your body, right? It doesn't matter. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach's for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Now, I feel confident in attributing both of these ideas to the Corinthians because Paul explicitly refutes both of them in today's passage. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food? No, Paul says. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So, in fact, notice Paul, Paul gets the meaning, right? Paul, uh, Paul includes this euphemism, the, you know, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and then he just flat out, he states what it literally means. The body's not meant for sexual immorality, he says. No, food is not meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, at least not in those sexual terms. The body is meant for the Lord, Paul says, and the Lord for the body. All right, take this other part of the Corinthian slogan, God will destroy both one and the other. Again, Paul says, no, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now, this last part is especially important for us to remember in the churches today because there are many in our brotherhood who are in the Corinthian camp on this one, just completely in the Corinthian camp, and maybe so thoroughly that they aren't even aware that they're in the Corinthian camp on this particular issue. The idea is that the body doesn't matter because it's just a temporary shell for my spirit. This body is going to die, it's going to go away, and my spirit is going to be freed. Again, it, it's dualism. It's Platonism. In fact, you will often hear passages like, you know, bodily exercise profiteth but a little, uh, used as proof texts for this uh, kind of view. Well, look at what Paul has said. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Paul, again, points to Christ. Points to what happens to him after the cross. God raised the Lord. And then he tells us that's going to be the basis for our raising. He will also raise us up by his power. And so the cross has something to teach us about this. The resurrection has something to teach us about this. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ teach us about our own resurrection? What does it teach us about Christ's body? Was Christ's body some temporary shell for his spirit that he then, his spirit escaped from? That's not what we find in the Gospels. When God raised the Lord, what was the Lord like? The Gospels tell us that our Lord had a body. In fact, that he still has a body. Remember, when the apostles think that they're seeing a ghost, the risen Lord tells them, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And the risen Lord, if we find it elsewhere in the Gospels, ate fish. The risen Lord had a body. Paul says the Lord, that God raised the Lord and will also raise us up. We're going to have bodies in the resurrection. Now, we're going to come to this again in greater detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because the brothers in Corinth misunderstood the resurrection just as badly as we do. But the point for us today is that the body is important. And in fact, that makes sense of Paul's entire response. God did not make the body as some temporary meat sack for our ghosts. 
it is not just our souls that God is concerned with, but with our bodies, because, again, God created both. And that is why so many of God's commandments are concerned with what we do with our bodies. I mean, if God didn't care about the body, uh, you think about it. it. The brethren in Corinth are actually kind of smart. If they were right, if God will destroy both one and the other, if, if God's going to destroy the body, the logical conclusion of that is he doesn't care about the body. But the scriptures tell us all over the place that God does care. Excuse me. He cares quite a bit about the body because so many of his commandments concern what we do with our bodies. And it is the entire basis by which Paul condemns the brothers in Corinth for hiring prostitutes. His entire condemnation of their hiring prostitutes is tied back to the importance of their bodies. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. In other words, the Lord is concerned with the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? The sexually immoral person sins against his own body, Paul says. And do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Many of us in American churches need to drastically reevaluate the way that we think about our bodies in terms of our faith. Our bodies are important. Now, it's not my purpose today to go into specifics beyond what Paul covers, condemning sexual immorality. Right? There are sins against God that are also sins against the body. Sexual immorality is among them. And it doesn't just include hiring prostitutes. It includes other things that Paul has already named in the letter. Uh, and remember, sexual immorality is a, a very broad umbrella term. Right? This includes a lot of stuff. And yes, it is absolutely possible to go to unbiblical extremes if we misapply this teaching that the body is a temple. There are people in American churches who do that, too. I'm not going to deny that, but that's, that's not what we see predominating in American churches. Look, I'm, I'm not telling anybody to drive out of the Corinthian ditch when it comes to the body, and just drive straight on over into the other ditch on the other side of the road. What I'm encouraging you to do is start taking stock of where the road is. Because if we share in this Corinthian idea, then we're in the ditch, and we need to get out of it. Well, that wraps us up for this week. I want to thank you for joining us this week. And, you know, God calls us to a high standard of living. All right, that's, that's what Paul is holding Corinth to. And we've just seen in Corinth that Christians often get this wrong. Right? Often we don't live the way that God tells us to live. Being a Christian does not mean that you have attained the kind of life that God calls us to. It means that you have accepted the call. It means that you are pursuing that kind of life. It means that you are trying to honor God in your body, as Paul tells those in Corinth. We call all people everywhere to turn away from sin. We give that call to everyone, not just those who are out in the world, but especially those who take Christ's name for themselves. Again, if we're going to say that we belong to Jesus Christ, then we need to behave like Jesus Christ. We need to act like we are pursuing the way of Christ. But we call all people everywhere to turn away from sin. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to become one. Right, find a Church of Christ near you, wherever you are at. If you're in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, we invite you to get in contact with us, the 14th Avenue Church of Christ. 
and whoever you find, you know, we're more than happy to study the way of Jesus with you. Believe the good news that God has sent his son to live among us, that he gave himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins, uh, that he was raised on the third day, that he has ascended to the right hand of God on high, and that he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Believe that good news. Turn away from sin. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. That invitation is open to everyone. I want to thank you again for tuning in. Join us next week as Paul tackles some of the Corinthians' questions about the nature of marriage. So we're going to see this is, this is not the end of their sexual hang-ups. All right, we've got the guy in 1 Corinthians 5 who has his father's wife. We've got some guys here in 1 Corinthians 6 who are visiting prostitutes. We're going to find that there are some guys in the Corinthian church who don't think that it's permissible for them to even have sex with their wives. Corinth is an odd bunch, um, but so are we. We look forward to seeing you next week whenever we jump into that. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.